In the first part of this series, we discussed the advantages the DB600 series had over its competitors, namely a superior supercharged drive coupling and a fuel injection system. Overall, the DB600 series of engines were good engines in theory. However, had they not suffered from the issues we're covering in today's video, they likely would have been even more fearsome. However, the fact was that between organizational issues, synthetic fuel problems, and the scarcity of strategic metals, the Daimler-Benz 601 and 605 were in an uphill battle for most of the conflict. And all these factors in unison, along with their second order effects, created a situation that effectively hamstrung all of the Luftwaffe's fighters for years. Let's find out why. But before we do that, however, I need to give credit where credit is due. Typically, while performing my research, I consult various sources to piece together the complete picture of the history. On the other hand, while researching this series, one source stands out among the others. I've mentioned it before, but Callum Douglas' secret horsepower race is the absolute standard regarding research on what went on with Germany's engine programs throughout the Second World War. To be clear, I'm not affiliated with Callum in any way, but I highly recommend picking up a copy of his book if you're interested in this content. The amount of hard work he did to unearth most of this research is definitely worth your time. In some of his presentations, Callum Douglas points out the common opinion in post-war historians that Britain's engine development programs were poorly managed compared to Germany's. However, the picture we see when we look at Germany's documents from the war paint the opposite view. For example, as we can see in the organizational chart from Britain's infrastructure laid out for their research and development of engines, near the bottom of the chart there's a position dubbed the RTO. These resident technical officers, as they were called, were the Air Ministry's employees who worked at Ground Zero within each engine manufacturer. What this meant in practical terms is that the Air Ministry had someone they could immediately get in touch with who was keenly aware of the challenges each engine manufacturer was facing. On the other hand, in Germany's system that employed no RTOs, the president of each engine manufacturing company would report directly to the RLM. This proved to be a massive mistake, as when asked what challenges needed to be overcome, presidents would usually claim there were none. As we'll look at later, this couldn't have been farther from the truth. Also, it left the reporting of critical details up to someone already managing quite a lot. That meant that if the lines of communication from the bottom of, say, Daimler-Benz didn't make their way up to the president, then it wouldn't be reported to the RLM, who would also be managing important things like fuel. To put it concisely, while this may seem like a relatively small difference between the two organizations' structures, in practical terms it was a world of difference regarding the quality of communication. We touched on Germany's fuel problem in part one of this series. Essentially, before the start of the conflict, Germany was entirely dependent on imported crude oil to supply its air force with gasoline. Perhaps smartly, Germany realized that if they started waging a large war, they would need a reliable source of fuel in the coming years. In 1939, Germany ended the importation of all foreign fuel. As such, the companies Renania Osag, DAPG, and DP Olks began cranking up the generation of synthetic fuel through the hydrogenation process from Germany's rich coal reserves and stockpiling it in underground storage facilities. Interestingly, the fact that Germany was the only country forced to stockpile fuel, storing it for a long duration in barrels, would prove to be another unforeseen issue later on. To understand a massive chunk of the design challenges Daimler-Benz was up against with its 600 series engines, we first need to understand the quirky intricacies of Germany's fuel situation beyond just its sourcing. First off, at the end of the day, Germany did create a position in which they could produce any fuel they wanted by heating and pressing coal along with hydrogen, creating their base product known as B4 fuel. This fuel was dyed blue in about 87 octane, which was decent for most applications, except if you wanted to squeeze every ounce of power possible out of a weight-limited application, such as the case in aircraft. In that case, the fuel would need to be processed through a few more steps in which either iso-octanes or other aromatics were added to increase the anti-knock capability of the fuel. To put this in context, Germany would continually struggle with the production inefficiencies inherent to creating high-octane fuel through hydrogenation. While being midway through the war, the Allies would be flying with a limitless supply of 150 octane, which ultimately allowed them to boost their engines to a higher degree. In any case, Germany's first high octane fuel was known as C2. Then subsequently, the formula was changed and dyed green, becoming what was known as C3 fuel. While engine designers initially thought that there were no differences between C2 and C3, despite the way they were made, one difference, which was C3's higher evaporation point, would become an issue in the coming months. Another issue would be the constant problem of having enough high-octane C3. In 1943, Germany's process for creating a high-octane fuel was painstaking, to say the least. 
At peak daily production, Germany took all of its brown coal, hard coal, and coal tar, then put it through a hydrogenation process that created 48,000 barrels of B4 aviation fuel. However, of that 48,000 barrels, 31,000 of it was dehydrogenated into a constituent that would eventually become C3, known as DHD gasoline, which had higher quantities of aromatics. After that, tetraethyl lead was added with either alkalites before 1943 or iso-octane after 1943. Additionally, a small amount of 2,000 barrels of crude oil was converted into more C3. That being said, it's important to remember that this was at their peak production, and it wasn't until Germany learned several hard lessons that they retuned their fuel plants to create this proportion of high-octane fuel. At first, their stockpiles were almost entirely B4 fuel, with very minimal reserves of high-octane proportionally. What this meant for Daimler-Benz in the early 40s was that they needed to make a gamble. They would have to either plan for using low compression engines and the standard B4 fuel, or design engines with higher performance that depended on C3. The Luftwaffe would have to decide between fielding mini fighters with suboptimal power, or gamble that fuel production would catch up and plan on fielding their fighter forces with high octane. If fuel issues weren't complicated enough, Germany also had trouble procuring enough strategic metal to stay competitive in the design war. Specifically, it was nickel and cobalt that Germany was in short supply of by the war's end. Of the two, nickel was the biggest issue. While the Allied engine designers had virtually no constraints in terms of materials, German designers were forced to begin manufacturing components with economy steel alloys stripped of their nickel. Because of this, when the poppet valves of the DB601 and the DB605 were switched to their economy versions, reducing the nickel content from 15 to 8%, the fuel began corroding the valves, which caused hotspots and subsequently engine knock. This engine knock would, over time, result in catastrophic engine failures. Cobalt was also in short supply after the Allies landed in French Morocco during Operation Torch. As such, Germany could not produce stellite, which was cobalt-based. Because these stellite coatings were used as a crutch to coat valves already made of economy steel, the loss of Germany's access to cobalt effectively kicked salt in their wounds. Ultimately, the Germans would have to rely on another coating to solve the issues with their economy steel valves. For both Daimler-Benz and the Luftwaffe in 1940, as the Battle of Britain began, it appeared they were easily winning the horsepower race with the introduction of the BF-109F, equipped with the DB-601E engine. The 109F represented a considerable step forward aerodynamically from the 109E, with a heavily streamlined nose, the supports removed, boundary layer ducting in the radiators, and an increased wing area. Along with the DB601E, which had implemented a new high valve overlap timing strategy for better cooling, the combination dominated the current Spitfire 5 and the Hurricane the RAF was fielding at the time. Unfortunately, due to Daimler-Benz's decision to use direct fuel injection, a critical problem was about to present itself. Later, to capitalize on the small stocks of high-octane green fuel Germany possessed, Daimler-Benz created the DB601N, which ran at a higher compression due to its flat-topped pistons. However, unbeknownst to Daimler-Benz, which had designed its engine to run on the current C2 fuel, the new C3 fuel had a higher evaporation point. This meant that in combination with their direct fuel injection system, which failed to vaporize all of the fuel and subsequently allowed it to be carried into the lubricant through the piston rings, the new C3 fuel was not evaporating once it mixed with the engine oil. Over time, the proportion of the C3 fuel to oil would get to the point where it compromised the oil's lubricating ability and the engine bearings would catastrophically fail. After an investigation, it was found that the bearing surfaces were coming away after about 200 hours and would need to be remetalled each time. Because developing a new fuel was out of the question, this problem led Daimler-Benz to consider amid a war, redesigning their fuel injection system along with their cooling system so they could hopefully boil off more of the fuel. That being said, despite realizing their design featured some significant flaws that needed to be fixed so they would remain competitive, Daimler-Benz still found it prudent to embark on an entirely new engine program. While Rolls-Royce was now desperately consolidating all of its efforts into the Merlin, Daimler-Benz was starting fresh with their new 16-cylinder, DB609. It seemed Daimler-Benz was unaware of how serious their problems were about to become. Soon, more reports of engine failure came pouring in from the front, and Daimler-Benz was at a loss for reasons why their engine was now vibrating and misfiring. The overhaul time had now become as little as 50 hours and leadership was fuming. At first, it was thought that the motor mounts were faulty, which allowed for excessive vibration. While Erhard Milch, the state secretary of the RLM, attempted to get to the bottom of the failures, a demoralizing order was sent out to the front, which officially derated the engines until a solution was found. While this was underway, Luftwaffe fighter pilots were prohibited from using their emergency power settings. And around the same time, the DB-601 began earning its nickname, the Flower Pot, due to its constant failures. 
Eventually, Milch published a report citing that these issues were overloading of the engine by the pilots, too low intake air pipe position because exhaust gas was entering the intake air, unsuitable rubber in the engine mounts, and the aid was initiated by reducing supercharger boost pressure limits from 1.42 to 1.35 atmospheres, changing the direction of the intake air pipe, and installation of harder rubber in the engine mounts. However, it would soon be discovered that none of these issues were the culprit. The real cause was new rubber self-sealing fuel tanks, which reacted with the high-octane C3 fuel when stored in these rubber tanks for extended period. As this occurred, the anti-knock capability of the fuel was compromised. Without the pilot's knowledge, these engines were forced to run above the anti-knock capability the fuel could ensure. Inside the tanks, after they were inspected, the fuel was turning a yellowish cloudy color instead of green, and a gray muddy residue was collecting at the bottom. On top of this, the need for more horsepower was a continual stressor for Daimler-Benz, and because they were always concerned that they may lose access to high-octane fuel at any moment due to its small quantities, they decided to bore out the DB601 series into what would become the DB605 and run on blue fuel. While early in the war, Daimler-Benz had a lot of problems to contend with, that isn't to say some developments weren't proving promising. Around 1940, Germany engine designers looked at another situation they would need to contend with in the coming months. Early on, during the Battle of Britain, it was discovered that Rolls-Royce engines had impressively good high-altitude performance compared to the German fighters. In hindsight, it isn't surprising that high-altitude performance wasn't prioritized due to German leadership's disposition about aerial combat at the time. As an example, when Kurt Tank, the Focke-Wulf chief designer, approached the RLM to pressure them into approving high-altitude engine developments, he was dismissed. As they said, quote, the war was being won on the ground." Unquote. As such, because long-term design changes were unlikely to be approved, designers concerned about high-altitude performance were forced to rely on quick-fix solutions like MONA. MONA was the codeword given to what the Germans began calling nitrous oxide, or GM1, for Goring Mixture 1. Goring himself had nothing to do with the development of nitrous oxide, but was called that for political reasons. Later, it was found that by injecting the nitrous oxide before the supercharger, about 400 additional horsepower was attained. While nitrous injection could increase takeoff power at sea level, it was instead used to make up horsepower losses at altitude. This helped assuage the disparity between the Daimler Benz and the Merlin at altitude while also preventing the DB601s from being overstressed at sea level, where they already had a performance advantage due to their hydraulic supercharger coupling. As we transition into the next chapter of this series, by 1941 or so, Daimler-Benz had begun to contend with some of the issues that would hamstring their engines, but more were on the horizon. Overconfident and poorly managed, they were still devoting an inappropriate amount of resources into research rather than continuing to improve the reliability and development of their frontline products. Specifically, they continued research into the turbocharged DB628, which, as designers should have known, would be far too large to be shoehorned into the BF109 series. Additionally, they were also starting a completely new program with their DB609 V16 engine, which was an upscaled version of their larger DB603 a V12. Perhaps if Daimler-Benz had consolidated their efforts much like Rolls-Royce did, they would have found viable solutions to the problems that were about to derate all of the Luftwaffe's fighters for over a year, which we'll discuss in part three. Thanks for tuning in to Flight Dojo. Please consider subscribing, and we'll see you guys next time.